Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we welcome you into this hour. Your Holy Spirit is our guide and our director. Take us where you want us to go. Lead us to the places that you want us to see and the information that we need to share. Father, thank you that you are with us wherever we go, whatever we do. We praise you and bless your name. Through Jesus, our Savior and Lord, we pray. Amen. Our first song says, Give thanks to the Lord because His love endures forever.
is, is talking about change and uh, the way that life happens. And it is called uh, The Day the Manna Stopped. From Joshua chapter 5. We did Joshua 6 last week. I had to go back and pick up Joshua 5 because it was such a, such a cool uh, analogy for us of our contemporary circumstance and situation. Let me turn with me there to Joshua chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. It says, On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. And the day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate of the produce of Canaan. What would you do? How would you respond if your way of life changed overnight? Oh wait, it did. It is. It has. If for the last 40 years you've done something one way and then all of a sudden it was over. It ended. How would you handle the transition? We have to go back and, and remember the manna, story of the manna. In the beginning of their wilderness wanderings, God knew that the people were going to need some assistance with food. Maybe we could call the manna God's food bank. Uh, but the people had to go out each day and gather the little wafers that had come on the ground, on the dew, of the, the dew of the ground. When it dried up, the wafers just kind of appeared. And they would gather them, except on the Sabbath. So for six days they would gather, and on the sixth day they gathered twice as much as they needed. Uh, but the manna wouldn't last more than one day, except on the sixth day. So the sixth day was special manna. Um, God allowed it to, to stay. The scripture also says that uh, God had, had this plan. The people complained and God said, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. And the people went out each morning and the scripture says that those who gathered little did not have too little and those that gathered much did not have too much. Kind of neat the way that happened. Uh, and the scripture says that when they tasted the manna the first time, that it was, they looked at it and it was white like coriander, but that it tasted like honey. And of course, somewhere along the way, they started grumbling and complaining about having to eat, go out and gather these wafers, gather this this things. We don't even know what they look like, are on the ground, and eating honey got tiresome and weary for them. Um, eventually, this sweet wafer became dissatisfying. But then again, if you ate the same thing every day for 40 years, <laughs> we might get a little tired of that. Now, for the, probably for the last five years, every morning I eat a granola bar. And it, it just makes life easier. I don't have to worry about what I'm going to eat unless we didn't get them at the grocery store. I just go to, and I grab a granola bar. I can take it with me. I can sit down and eat it there um, and have a cup of tea with it, usually. And, I, and I'm happy eating the same thing every day for breakfast. I don't eat the same thing every day for lunch. That's what they had. That's what they made their meals out of. Um, the, uh, 
psalmist says of the manna that it was the grain of heaven. And it was, in another place, the psalmist writes and says it was the food of the angels. Why wouldn't we want the bread of heaven, the grain of heaven, and the food of the angels? Why wouldn't we want to keep eating that? Joshua has just led the people across the Jericho. They picked up the rocks when they got there. Um, when they came through and, and built that stone of remembrance. Um, this same time of year, the spring, is the grain harvest. Now it is, it is important because we may not recognize it, but when they say they celebrated the Passover, we just talked about all those feasts of God, right? And so the Passover happens on the 14th day of the first month for the Jews, but it's for us, it's the first month of spring. So the winter harvest of the winter grains, the barley and the wheat, the early harvest was ripe at that time of the year. And when the people went over, they celebrated the Passover. And remember what the next feast is? The next feast is the, the feast of first fruits, right? So they present an offering to the Lord, and then they have the, um, the seven days of unleavened bread. First day is a special day, and then seven days of unleavened bread, and, and on the Sabbath day, or the day after the Sabbath that happens, is the first fruits, and they can present to the Lord the first fruits, the crop, and then they can eat the new grain instead of the old grain. So all of this falls together. When you understand those celebrations, you understand this was in the spring of the year. The flood, the Jordan River was at flood stage. It may have been a mile wide at that point there in, uh, around Jericho. And they crossed over and dry ground. And then they celebrated the Passover. And then they went out and they picked, they, they plundered, if you will, right, this gardens of the people who were living in the area. Before they attacked the town of Jericho, they recognized the Passover and celebrated it. They collected grain from the land around them, enough to make uh, bread for the necessary feasts. And now the day after they celebrated, and the scripture is not really clear about how long that took, it may have been after the seven days of unleavened bread. It may have been on the very next day. But the day after the celebration ended, it says, God did not send any more man. Life changed that day for them. The manna never came again, or at least not until Jesus. Because Jesus says to us that He is the manna that came down from heaven from people. Uh, God will provide, though, right? Even though the way of life changed, God provided. Some might say that God abandoned the Israelites there, and although it's not in Scripture, again, I think that some of the Israelites might have said, God abandoned us. They've been getting up six days a week, for 40 years and going out and gathering manna and imagine their, the first day that they saw it, manna actually means in, in Hebrew, what is it? <laughs> they went out and said, manna, what is it? And so that's what they called it. And then they went out the day after they had celebrated the Passover in the promised land, they went out and they went, where is it? It's not here anymore. What happened? How could God provide them for them for 40 years and just let them go in one day? How cruel is God to do this to these people? Well, you could certainly look at it like that. Or you could see that God was simply shifting from provision in one source to provision 
in another source. God was shifting his focus, but really their source was the same. It was God. God had always been providing for them, and God was still providing for them just in a new way, in a different way. It was all coming from God. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, this is before they started the journey. God says to them this, When the Lord your God brings you into the land that He swore to give your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to you a land with large, flourishing cities that you did not build. Houses filled with all kinds of good things that you did not provide. Wells for water that you did not dig. Vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. And then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God. So God's already told them 40 years before the man is going to come, but when it stops, it's going to stop. There's going to be grain that you didn't plant, grapes that you didn't tend, olive trees that you didn't have anything to do with. And you know, with olive trees in particular, the people who plant them understand that it's for the next generation because it often takes that long for an olive tree to mature and to be able to produce enough fruit for those who need it. We might think that God had abandoned them, but in reality, God had just shifted their blessing to come from a previously unknown source. Now, it is impressive if you look at the wanderings, especially as they were approaching uh, the promised land on their journey, they always, Moses always sent a message to the king of the land saying, let us pass through. We'll stay on the path. We won't take anything out of your fields. We won't take anything from your people. We won't take a goat. We won't take a sheep. We won't take uh, an oxen. We won't take anything of yours. And he could promise that. Because God was providing all that they needed. When they got into the promised land, they were going to take over. And the crop that had been planted by the inhabitants was going to be theirs. When God removes the familiar, I was listening yesterday to a, a podcast uh, from a couple of Church of God pastors. Um, one that's just recently been started and they were going to be telling stories from around the world. And this particular podcast was talking about the changes in the church that COVID-19 has brought about. And how life in the church is not going to be the same anymore. Those Congregations that have pews are having to rope off every other one to keep people socially distanced. They're having to remove some of them to have more services, fewer people in each one, to disinfect between all kinds of changes, stuff we talked about last week that we don't have to do because we're a small group. If we had thousands of people worshiping with us, what a difficult thing it would be to try and make those changes. Most of the people in Israel had never known anything else. All of the people above 40 years old had died in the wilderness. All of the, the generation that came out of Egypt as adults died in the wilderness. And most of the people in the assembly of Israel were under 40 years old. Which means that they only knew one way of eating every day. Man. 
and quail when God sent them. They only knew that. And now it changed. How many of them began to question God? They would have thought that God had provided more for them when they came into the promised land, but instead God provides less, but still more, different, fresh. He brought them over in the harvest season, just in time. How would you feel if all of your life and all the life of your children and your grandchildren, you could always count on the fact that each and every morning, six out of seven mornings, there was going to be little white wafers on the ground and you were going to be able to eat. And now all of a sudden you have to find another source for nourishment. And though God never changes, Yet his blessings do not always appear to come from the same source. God never changes. He will always provide. But just because he's always going to provide doesn't mean he's going to provide the same thing in the same way forever. The real source of every blessing is the person of God. Too often we begin to look at the things that we're familiar with as the blessings. We begin to worship them. We begin to uh, come to, to be so familiar with them and comfortable with them. When what God does sometimes is He changes things just so we'll rely more on Him. And remember, that's not the blessing He is. God is the real giver. God is the true provider. In the Hebrew, they called him Jehovah Jireh, the provider of all things. In your life, when the manna stops coming, when the familiar is gone, begin to look for a new source. Because God said He would never leave us or forsake us. Begin to look for the grain in the field instead of the manna on the ground. When the manna doesn't come, maybe it's because God is pointing you to the olive tree or the vineyard. Maybe God has something better for you waiting. He certainly will provide. That's who He is. Father, the old saying, the times they are changing. is so true in our world today. Father, some of us are well-suited and adapted to change. But others are comfortable with the status quo and the way we've always been. Lord, as you transition your church, not just here, but around the world, to a new normal, as you transition us to the, to the new fruit, the new source of fruit. Remind us that you are the source, that you are our provider. Remind us that you have an abundant supply. Father, We're not asking today for you to fill our cups to overflowing. But just give us enough. Give us what we need. And 
You may not make it rain manna from heaven. But Father, point us in the direction of the field that you've provided. For the harvest that you've appointed. And Father, if there's someone here today who needs to make a commitment of themselves to you and to trust you for their future, speak to their heart now. Allow them to claim the name of Jesus as their Savior and their Lord. And to begin living for you and with you. Jesus, I pray.